Hello and welcome to this basics episode on railway food, a topic I'm sure we can all get our teeth into. The earliest mainline railways made no provision for on-train or even on-station dining. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which opened in September 1830, forbade the sale and consumption of alcohol on any of its premises and on its trains. It also forbade the sale and consumption of some foodstuffs, including the famous Lancashire Eccles cake. In stagecoach days, it had been the custom to change horses at coaching inns. The horse is obviously exhausted. And at the coaching inns, the passengers could stretch their legs, go to the toilet and get something to eat whilst the horses were being changed. But with no horses to change on the railways, it meant railway passengers were now locked in their compartment for the entire journey. There was no lighting other than oil lamps hung outside the carriage. There was no heating and no toilet. For the journey between Liverpool and Manchester, which was estimated to take about an hour and a half, it was probably doable for those with strong bladder control. Or you had to make sure you went before you boarded the train, not that there were any toilets at the station. But the tradition of stopping at wayside inns en route died hard, and on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the drivers and guards were admonished for stopping their trains at the various inns and pothouses on the way, such as the railway tavern at Patrycroft, to allow the passengers to get something to eat and drink. The board of directors, of course, were furious and quickly passed bylaws against this already prohibited practice. With the advent of the first trunk routes from London to Liverpool and Manchester via Birmingham or London to Bristol, sitting locked in a compartment with no food, drink or toilet was not such a good idea for a journey of six to eight hours or more. Many companies therefore opened grand refreshment rooms at their stations where all trains would stop. The most infamous being Wolverton on the London North Western Railway, where one letter writer implored travellers not to drink the coffee and avoid the pork pies, as, quote, very few pigs are reared in that area, end quote. At Swindon in 1842, the Great Western Railway made the decision to lease the operation of its refreshment rooms to a private company for a duration of 99 years. Under this agreement, every train was to stop for 10 minutes at Swindon so the passengers could refresh themselves all in one mad rush. Brunel described the coffee at Swindon as tasting burn and speculated it had been made from roasted corn and he personally avoided any food or drink on offer at Swindon. The situation with every train stopping for 10 minutes at Swindon only ended in 1895 when the Great Western purchased the lease for the refreshment rooms Victorian railway food became notorious for its poor quality. The great novelist Charles Dickens wrote in 1862, I cannot dine on stale sponge cakes that turn to sand in the mouth. I cannot dine on shining brown pasties composed of unknown animals within and offering to my view the device of an indigestible starfish in a leaden pie crust. I cannot dine on a sandwich that has long been pining under a glass dome, turning brown and curling at the edges. On-train dining began when James, later Sir James Allport, manager of the Midland Railway, introduced luncheon baskets on long-distance Midland Railway train services in 1875. These were a wicker basket containing a hot or cold meal, beer, wine and all the cutlery, crockery, glassware and napery one would need. They proved immediately popular with the travelling public. By 1905, the London and South Western Railway were selling over 60,000 a year, but also reported an enormous amount of pilferage, not only of the baskets themselves, but the contents within, including the cutlery, crockery, glassware and so forth. Another alternative to the luncheon basket was what was then termed the tea wagon. This was a tea trolley pushed down the platform at station stops, which sold tea, coffee, hot chocolate and cake to passengers on board through the open window. Newspapers and chocolate bars were also sold in a similar manner. The first true dining car in Britain was introduced by the Great Northern Railway on the 26th of September 1879 between London and Leeds. It used an imported American Pullman car, fitted up with a kitchen, a dining saloon and a men's only smoking compartment. It was a typical Pullman car with a tall clear story and end verandas. 
The contemporary press described it as, and I apologise in advance, a Yankee novelty. But because British trains were devoid of corridors, it meant that once you were seated in this grand dining car, there you remained for the entire journey. The other great British railway companies were soon trying to catch up with the Great Northern. The London and North Western Railway introduced what it declared to be the first dining car in Britain in March 1889 between London, Euston and Manchester, obviously trying to desperately ignore what the Great Northern had done ten years earlier. The LNWR dining train used two saloon carriages permanently coupled with a corridor connection in between. These carriages were only 34 feet long and apparently rode very badly, but in spite of this they lacked nothing in terms of opulence. The press at the time declared them hotels on wheels. Dining cars became an opportunity for railway companies to demonstrate their wealth and taste, or sometimes to modernise their lack of taste. They became a riot of fine carpentry, polished wood, deep pile carpets, flocked wallpapers and gilt. Everything which could be decorated was. Even in third class, the dining cars were as gorgeously decorated as their first class counterparts. The dining car really came into its own following the introduction of corridors to British trains in the 1890s, and these allowed passengers from the length of the train to get a meal. A uniformed valet would walk the length of the train, ringing a small handbell, announcing the first or second call for luncheon or dinner, depending on the time of the train. Usefully, corridors also meant that everyone could access the toilet. The 1890s and the Edwardian period were, for the lucky few who could afford to travel, a golden age for the dining car. These were lavishly, opulently decorated cars, with an at-seat à la carte menu with waiter service. The kitchens had gas-fired rangers, capable of preparing and cooking a wide menu of meals to order. All the provisions of a country house or best hotel were on board, with larders and even a butler's pantry, where the wines and spirits were kept under lock and key, under the watchful eye of a maître de haute. There were smoking rooms for the gentlemen, and tea parlours for the ladies. One newspaper columnist remarked that these trains resembled the, quote, Palace of Versailles on wheels, end quote. All of this could not last, however, and the First World War brought down the curtain on the fond de siècle opulent rail travel, whilst an even more exciting period, that of the Art Deco streamliner, was waiting in the wings. So that has been a brief look at railway dining in Britain from 1830 to 1890. In its nature, it has been itself an overview of the period, and we will be going back to looking at specific time periods and different carriages in greater detail, and, of course, Mr George Mortimer Pullman himself, and his Belgian counterpart, Monsieur Georges Nagel Marker. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you have, please like, share and subscribe, and click the notification bell. If you would like early access to channel content, you can do so by supporting Rail Story on Patreon, for as little as a takeout cup of coffee once per month, as many of you have. And see you all next time on Rail Story.